In this screencast, we're going to develop the idea of an impulse response, which is related to an impulsive force. We're going to use our spring mass system, which we've seen before and developed the analytical solutions for. We're going to first take a look at the position response and then apply an impulsive force to determine what this impulse response looks like. So first, as in all systems, let's apply a reference frame. And here we have an inertial reference frame in which E1 is along the positive x direction and then E2 would be in the opposite direction of gravity. Now when we work these oscillatory motion problems, it's good to have your coordinate system set as zero where the system is at rest. And so we defined a coordinate system transformation of z as a function of t is equal to x as a function of t minus x naught, x naught which is the resting length of a spring. And if we draw this on our system, we'll make a resting length of the spring right here and then our coordinate z as moving from this equilibrium point of where the spring is. So right here our mass p is extended so that it's stretched beyond the equilibrium point of the spring. And then as one final part to set up our exploration of a position response and an impulse re response, we've already created an analytic solution for this. So we said that the solution for the position, z, is equal to an initial position, which we call z at time is equal to zero, cosine, and this is a mega naught t, plus the speed at time zero, divided by omega naught multiplied times sine of omega naught times t. And this is where omega naught is the natural frequency of the system and that's defined by the spring constant k divided by the mass and putting all that under a radical. If you have any confusion about what we just now wrote down, if you don't understand where this coordinate transformation came from or where this analytic solution with the natural frequency came from, then I highly encourage you to revisit the previous screencast where we solved this spring mass system for an analytic solution. Now let's define what we mean by a position response. A position response is where you'll take a system that's at rest and then will change its initial position or its orientation and in this case we've drawn this mass so that it's extended beyond the equilibrium position which is the resting length of the spring. And if we let this go, intuitively I hope you see that the mass is going to oscillate back and forth about this equilibrium position. And so what we've done is we've given it an initial position and then let it go, but we haven't given it an initial speed. So when we look down at our analytic solution for the position z, we've said that at time is equal to zero, that we've given it a positive value, and then we've given it no initial speed. So that means that we're only working with one term in the solution, and then that gives us a cosine function, which is a function of the natural frequency and time. So let's plot this on our figure here, in which we have a z naught as in a starting position, so this would be the position response, and so because it's a cosine function, we're going to oscillate between z naught and negative z naught, or z at time zero and negative time z at time zero, in a cosine wave, and then this cosine has a period equal to one over the natural frequency. And this is the position response of the system, one here that's going to be governed or bound by the initial amplitude that the mass is pulled away from the equilibrium point and is going to oscillate according to this cosine back and forth between those points. Now because we don't have any damping in this system that oscillation is going to occur indefinitely. So now let's shift gears into the impulse response and what we're saying here is that with an impulse response we're setting our initial position equal to zero and then we'll have an initial speed applied to the system z dot. And the reason why this is an impulse response is because we're going to use an impulsive force 
to be able to generate this z dot term. And so if we look at this, we see that this sine wave is going to oscillate between a magnitude of z dot over omega naught back and forth. And so let's plot that. We'll have our bounds, which are z dot over omega naught and negative z dot over omega naught. And draw our bounds. And then we have a sine wave, which is going to be z begin at the position of z is equal to 0. And it's going to oscillate back and forth between our bounds. Now let's tie this into our discussion about an impulsive force. Because if we're going to have, if we're going to be starting at 0 and then have a change in position, we have to apply, in this case, an initial speed. And this initial speed is, as we said earlier, is created by an impulsive force. Now our impulsive force here is going to be from time t1 to time t. It's applied to the mass in the positive x direction. So let's draw our impulsive force that's creating this impulse response. And so first let's add our impulsive force to our system diagram. So we have our impulsive force that we said goes from t1 to t2. It's pointed in the positive e1 direction. And because we're applying this impulse at the very beginning of this period, this entire expression occurs at the time is equal to zero. So remember that t1 and t2 are so closely put together that this is an instantaneous change in speed. And so this is going to give us our initial condition in which we have z dot at time zero is equal to a real number. And so we know that we need an initial speed for an initial condition. We know that's linked to the impulse of force. And we know that that's done through our impulse momentum relationship. And so the relationship says that the mass multiplied times the speed at time two, and this is in the e1 direction, is equal to the mass multiplied times the speed at time one, also in the e1 direction, because it's a vector expression. And then we're going to add to that the impulse of force from t1 to t2. We know that at time is equal to t1, that the system isn't moving, so there's no momentum, momentum in the system. At t2, we do have momentum in the system. This is giving us our initial condition, and this is caused by the impulse from t1 to t2. So t2 is still at time 0, we said. So let's write our z dot of 0, which is still our initial condition. And so this will be equal to our impulse from t1 to t2 over that small period of time divided by our mass. So now substitute our result here of z dot at time 0 is equal to the impulse over the mass into our z dot at time 0. And then our expression, which defines the result of the impulse, is going to be 0 because we don't have an initial position. And then we get our impulse from t1 to t2 over our mass multiplied times our natural frequency multiplied times sine over omega naught times t. And so I hope that you intuitively see that if you increase the impulse on a system, then its displacement is going to scale by the magnitude of the impulse. So if we create an impulse that's twice as much as, as what we've drawn here, we would expect the, the displacement to be twice as much at its peaks, but it would maintain the same natural frequency according to the sign uh, that we have here, the same period as well, so 1 over omega naught. Now one of the primary ways that you're going to see this applied in future courses is with the use of a unit impulse function. So a unit impulse is going to be from time t1 to time t2. And just like the name says, is that this is equal to 1. So if we're taking our impulse, it's the integral of the force over time equal to 1. And this unit impulse function is the classic perturbation that's applied to second order systems that you'll see in future courses like system dynamics, or controls. So to summarize what we've done here is we've taken this solution to the spring mass system 
And before, we've only used a position perturbation, which is pulling the system back to a particular position away from its equilibrium and letting it go. Up until now, we've really ignored this term, which is if we give this system an initial speed and don't give it an initial position, and mathematically we see that this is a sine function. But the way that we generate this speed is through our impulse-momentum relationship.